Somehow there had been a mix-up. The plan was for all nine of them to arrive together. Strength in numbers. But on the morning of September 4th, 1957, Elizabeth Eckford, a 15-year-old African-American student, stood outside Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. Surrounding her was a raging mob of 400 white students and parents, screaming racial slurs and threatening violence. In the photo we've all seen, Elizabeth looks composed and resolute. But the truth is, she was terrified. She feared for her life. Elizabeth Eckford prayed for protection and looked for someone to come to her aid. At one point, she saw an older woman in the crowd with a kindly face. When Elizabeth looked at her with pleading eyes, the woman spat in her face. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more... For huddled union, masses yearning to breathe consider free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody is free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about American history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 40, in which we look at one of the iconic moments of the civil rights movement, the Little Rock Nine and the effort to integrate the public schools of Little Rock, Arkansas. We are coming to you this week from the 101st Airborne Studios, located on the campus of Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for In the Past Lane. Putting up with all our nonsense and mistakes week after week is our indispensable executive producer, Lulu Spencer. Well, things are going great here at In the Past Lane. It's only a week until September 30th, which, as you all know, is International Podcast Day. And, drumroll please, it's also the day the annual podcast awards will be announced. We, In the Past Lane, are in the running for an award in the society and culture category. So, good listeners, Think positive thoughts this week. And keep on emailing and sending messages via Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I love hearing from listeners. Let me know what you like about the podcast, but also send along your suggestions for things you'd like to see changed or topics you'd like to see me cover. You're all part of In the Past Lane's listener community, and I really value your input. I also value the kind words many of you sent my way regarding the recent passing of Molly, this podcast's faithful beagle, whose snoring appears at the end of each episode. Thanks a lot. Many listeners also commented on how much they liked the recent episode featuring my interview with the great documentary filmmaker Ken Burns about his new documentary on the Vietnam War. A lot of you mentioned it was a great companion piece to watching the documentary on PBS. So thanks for letting me know. And please do me the favor of sharing the episode with your friends and family. Person-to-person recommendations are one of the top ways that a podcast can grow its listening community. And a quick heads up. Looking ahead, we have upcoming episodes on the Battle of Saratoga, the key turning point in the American Revolution, another episode on the influence of Southern slaveholders on U.S. foreign policy before the Civil War, and an incredible story of a sensational murder in Jim Crow, Mississippi in 1932. Plus lots more, so stay tuned. Okay, people, let's go looking for some history. Your journey in the past lane begins now. In just a few minutes, I'll speak with historian Erin Kretko Devlin about her new book, Remember Little Rock. But before I do, let's take a minute to consider the way we think about the civil rights movement. In particular, the way we remember it. For most Americans, the civil rights movement is a story of heroism and determination. And it's a story of victories, each marked by dramatic incidents that have been captured in video and photographs. Rosa Parks on the Montgomery bus boycott. The Little Rock Nine in Arkansas the sit-ins in Greensboro, North Carolina, the Freedom Riders, the march from Selma to Montgomery, 
the March on Washington, and Dr. Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, the passage and signing of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, and the Voting Rights Act in 1965. In popular memory, all these events add up to a great achievement in American history. It's the story of how the United States finally did the right thing when it came to race and equality, by tearing down the walls of Jim Crow that had shut most African Americans out of the American dream. Now, on one level, that is the story of the civil rights movement. It's a story of progress. But there's also a pernicious aspect to this way of remembering the civil rights movement. Framing it as a series of heroic victories that led to ultimate victory by 1965 urges us to see it as a done deal. It goes like this. For a long time, African Americans were oppressed under Jim Crow. But then there was Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. And everything was made right. Voting rights were restored. Whites-only signs were removed. Employment discrimination was outlawed. And schools were desegregated. Mission accomplished. But just because we want that to be true doesn't make it so. The civil rights movement achieved many important victories. But it left essentially untouched many powerful and invisible policies and practices that sharply curtailed opportunities for African Americans. To cite just one example, consider policing practices and the so-called get-tough-on-crime policies of the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. For more on this topic, I highly recommend you listen to episode 22 of this podcast on the origins of mass incarceration. Today, we'll look at another immense problem that calls into question just how successful the civil rights movement was. Racial segregation in the nation's public schools is still a huge problem. And it's getting worse. And the problem isn't just segregation. Because data shows that segregated schools offer fewer college prep courses and fewer courses and programs in the arts compared to white majority schools. Segregated schools also have lower graduation rates and higher rates of suspensions and expulsions for discipline problems. In other words, students in these schools in 2017 are being offered an education that is separate and unequal. How is this possible? How did we get here? Well, part of the problem is that many Americans, remembering uplifting moments like the Little Rock Nine desegregating Central High School 60 years ago this month, believe the problem of segregation in public schools was solved decades ago. It's in the past. Well, as my next guest, Aaron Kretko Devlin will explain, that happy memory is one of the things that stands in the way of our confronting and resolving the scourge of segregation. Don't go anywhere, people. In the past lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We'll be right back. If you are enjoying this podcast, then please subscribe to In the Past Lane at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. Subscribing is free, and once you do it, new episodes of In the Past Lane are automatically downloaded to your listening device. Subscribing also gives you access to the entire back catalog of In the Past Lane episodes. And if you do subscribe, please leave a review. Thanks. All right, back at In the Past Lane, and with me now is Erin Krutko Devlin. She is an assistant professor of history and American studies at the University of Mary Washington. Her work focuses on historical memory and public history, especially as it relates to race and civil rights. And that's why we're speaking with her today, because she's recently published a new book titled Remember Little Rock. It's just come out in time for the 60th anniversary of the crisis that erupted in Little Rock, Arkansas in September 1957 over school desegregation. Erin Kretko Devlin, welcome to In the Past Lane. Thanks for having me. I'd like to begin by asking you to sketch out the background of Little Rock for our listeners. The crisis in Little Rock in 1957 is a product of the landmark Supreme Court decision three years earlier, Brown v. Board of Education, and that case declared essentially racial segregation in schools unconstitutional. So can you tell our listeners why the nation turned its eyes to Little Rock, Arkansas in 1957 and how the essential events there played out? Well, in the immediate aftermath of the Brown versus Board of Education decision, the Little Rock School District, under the leadership of its superintendent of schools, Virgil Blossom, put together a plan that was designed to comply with the mandate of the Brown decision to desegregate its schools by doing as little as possible. Um, And essentially, they crafted a plan that would result in the initial integration of Little Rock schools with just the admittance of nine African-American students to one high school in the center of the city, known as Central High. 
The NAACP actually challenged this plan in the federal courts of law on the grounds that it did not do enough, but the courts upheld it as sort of a first step towards the process of desegregating their city schools. But for many avid and ardent segregationists in Little Rock and elsewhere, even this minimal process of integration with nine students entering Central High was unimaginable. And Governor Orville Faubus, who was the governor of Arkansas at the time, sought to appease this constituency by deploying Arkansas National Guard outside of Central High School in order to block the nine African-American students who became known as Little Rock Nine from entering Central High in September of 1957. This precipitated a constitutional crisis because the governor had effectively interposed himself between the federal courts and the application of the Brown decision in Little Rock itself. And President Eisenhower, who was no sort of advocate of the Brown decision, nevertheless recognized that he had a constitutional responsibility to enforce the Supreme Court decision. And as a result, he deployed the 101st Airborne to Little Rock in order to escort Little Rock 9 into Central High School to ensure that the Supreme Court's mandate in Brown versus Board was fulfilled. So that's the sort of story in a, in a nutshell. And if we cl- stop the clock here, which I always say to my students, no, acknowledging that you can't, but if we stop the clock right there, you essentially an iconic moment in the course of the, of the civil rights movement. I mean, it has the federal government getting back in the business of protecting civil rights, something it had given up a, a century or almost a century earlier. Eisenhower steps in at great political risk. And as you note, there are figures that emerge as as heroes, the Little Rock Nine, those nine students who seek to gain admission and ultimately do. And there's also what truly makes it iconic are these photos, photos of these students being harassed and being escorted by heavily armed members of the 101st Airborne. So at that moment, it really does seem like one of these great stepping stones towards the ultimate victory in the civil rights movement. But as your book points out, you identify, you know, there's a really key problem with this, what you call the triumphant narrative of the civil rights movement, which is that it's incomplete and superficial and quite misleading. And maybe you could just tell us more about it. Maybe tell us how you identify or how you, I guess, how you define the, this triumphant narrative and start us off thinking about how it, you know, how it functions, who, whose interest is it in and, and how it functions to really warp our memory of Little Rock and also the larger civil rights movement. Sure. Well, the triumphal narrative of sort of racial progress that we've crafted and celebrated in this country over the course of the last 50 years, of course, not only applies to education, but to a variety of spheres of American life. And essentially, we've sort of crafted this narrative in which uh, we celebrate the victories of the mid-century civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s, the direct action campaigns, the iconic protest marches, the events like the desegregation of Little Rock High School in 1957. But we do so in a way that is largely uncritical and doesn't encourage us to reflect on sort of the persistent racial problems that continue to exist in American society. So the reason why I call it a triumphant narrative of racial progress is because it sort of is imbued with this sense that we have done everything that needs to be done in order to sort of eliminate the sort of stain of racism from our nation's past. Um, And the reason why that has ongoing consequences and effects is because if we sort of accept the premise that we've addressed all the racial problems in the past, then the corollary to that is that systemic racism doesn't exist today and that we don't need to do anything in order to counteract it. Right. Essentially, that things were solved, you know, in this case in 1957 and then in other, you know, in subsequent legislation and such in 64 and 65, and that the work is essentially done. That's right. But if we look at the reality of persistent racial inequality in the United States today, we can see that this rhetoric that is so popular in our public discourse doesn't really reflect real conditions on the ground, right? So in our most recent analysis of data um, in 2010 from the U.S. Department of Education, they found that nearly 5 million African-American and Latino students in the United States continue to attend what they described as segregated schools that were 90 to 99 percent non-white. And an additional 3 million attended what they referred to as apartheid schools that were 99 to 100% non-white. So if as a nation, we had actually done what our mythology suggests, which is that we sort of address racial discrimination and segregation through the victories of the mid-century civil rights movement, then we wouldn't continue to see these conditions persisting today. Right. And so this is uh, where we are, you know, 50, now 60 years on, where we actually have to face the fact that segregation is in many ways worse than it was 
back in the 1950s, which is always a shocking thing for people to, to hear. And it's really something that people literally do not want to hear. But let's circle back a little bit and get, eventually get back to that spot. But let's circle back to the immediate aftermath of, you know, in 1957, in 1958. This is a story that is really an ongoing story, because as you point out, the desegregation of Little Rock is really very superficial, very token form of desegregation. And the first two sort of people that seem to square off are Virgil Blossom, who you mentioned. He's the superintendent of schools and the NAACP and Daisy Bates, who's the head of the local chapter there. And it really pits two different visions of reform and racial justice against each other. One is Virgil Blossom embodies this go slow, do the least amount possible, try to keep this as in control and, and really not have desegregation, but appear to be doing desegregation. And then you've got activists who see quite obviously this is inadequate and they really push and they never stop pushing. So tell us more about these two figures in this, these sort of early stages of this post-57 moment. So as I mentioned earlier, superintendent of schools, Virgil Bossom, had been integral to developing this policy of minimal compliance, right? How to comply with the Brown decision by doing as little as possible. And you refer to this style as passive resistance with a P? Yes. And maybe just quickly identify what that is, but maybe first ex- explain what massive resistance is. Sure. Because passive resistance is its quieter and in many ways more successful companion. Right. So when many students first encounter the Little Rock School desegregation crisis in 1957, they're immediately struck by the iconic images that we associate with this event, right? The harassment of Little Rock 9 by the mobs gathered outside of Central High School, the lines of the National Guard with their rifles at the ready, keeping the students outside of the building, scenes of racial violence between whites and blacks immediately outside of the building. And in Little Rock at the time, as well as through memorial practice, there have been sort of symbolic renunciations of that kind of overt violence known as massive resistance, right? The idea that the Brown decision was not legally decided, that it wasn't based or rooted in historical precedent, that it was a violation of states' rights, and therefore Southern states were not obligated to comply with it at all. But there was another strain of resistance to Brown that was known as passive resistance. And moderates, racial moderates, as they described themselves and as they self-identified, advanced a different strategy for resisting the Brown decision. And essentially what they argued was that there was no way to completely prevent Brown from being implemented. In fact, they argued that the kind of overt resistance that was associated with the mobs outside of Central High School would only invite more federal intervention, right, and would ultimately produce more integration, which they argued was not desirable. So they suggested that a model of passive resistance or what is also known as minimal compliance was preferable. And in this case, they set up a variety of procedures that were designed to ensure that segregation would proceed as slowly as possible. So in Little Rock, for example, they actually, in advance of integrating their schools, constructed two new high schools in highly racially segregated neighborhoods. And they did that to ensure that those high schools would remain white and black in their identification long into the future. They also developed transfer program in which African-American students would be assigned by default to the Negro High School, as it was known, unless they applied for a transfer specifically to go to Central High School, even if they lived in the neighborhood directly around Central. And then they also used a variety of other pressures to persuade students not to apply for those transfers. So, for example, they told athletes they would not be able to participate in sports. They screened students for not only their academic records, but also for their sort of character or emotional stability and the like. And it was through all these mechanisms that the Little Rock School District was able to initially winnow down the number of students in Little Rock who would integrate Central High in September of 1957 to just nine. And these are African-American students that you were talking about. These, they're the ones being subjected to all this extraordinary scrutiny. That's right. And it's worth keeping in mind that there are hundreds of students, African-American students, who actually live in the neighborhood directly surrounding Central High. Right. So when we're talking about this process of winning weighing the students down, it is quite severe in terms of the ways in which these procedures actually eliminate prospective students from being even considered for this initial moment of integration into Central High. And this lasts for almost a decade, right? I mean, they're pretty, it's a very effective strategy put forth by the passive resistance crowd to really stymie any real reform. And 
And then there's a, a bit of a turning point or a potential turning point in 1968 with the Supreme Court decision, Green versus New Kent County, that the Supreme Court essentially says these measures do not go far enough. They are not moving along fast enough. They don't go far enough to really correcting the problem. And this, in some ways, opens the door for potentially real significant reform when it comes to addressing inequities in education. That's right. Civil rights advocates, really, since the Brown versus Board of Education decision in 1954, had been insisting that the kinds of processes and procedures that were being put in place in districts like Little Rock were insufficient and were little more than a smokescreen that was really designed to continue to preserve the dual system of white and black schools in the South. And Daisy Bates, who was Little Rock Nine's mentor in Arkansas, really advanced that perspective in her retrospective account of the crisis that was published in 1963, in which she essentially argued that the kinds of procedures that had been put in place by Virgil Blossom and the school board were of a kind with the strategies of massive resistance that had been promoted by the mobs outside of Central High School that they were just as effective, if not more so, in keeping African-American students out of schools and the kind of symbolic distance that figures like Virgil Blossom tried to put between themselves and overt racists outside of Central High was little more than symbol, right? In substance, their policies achieved the same effect. And civil rights advocates advanced this claim not only through retrospective memoirs like the kind that Daisy Bates wrote, but also through federal courts of law. And in 1968, the Supreme Court does say that school districts have a responsibility to produce plans that are effective, right? Not just racially neutral on their face, but in terms of their results. And it's in Green versus New Kent County where they say that school districts must eliminate segregation root and branch. And that decision opens the way for all kinds of other desegregation remedies like busing and things like that that come into play in the late 1960s and early 1970s to achieve those objectives. And some of those programs, not just in places like Little Rock, but elsewhere and most probably most famously or infamously in Boston, really do start to show the potential for addressing this problem and solving it or mitigating this problem substantially. Would you characterize it that way and then tell us what happens next in terms of the, the way in which these desegregation programs are undone or stymied to a large degree by politicians, and particularly by judges, once we get to the 1980s? Sure. So... Busing or student transportation, depending on how you want to refer to it, had an enormous effect on the processes of school desegregation. In a school district like Little Rock, busing was implemented to sort of undo the kinds of residential gerrymandering that the Little Rock School District had put in place in 1957. You know, they had constructed those high schools deliberately in order to ensure that their populations would remain predominantly white or predominantly black. And busing was really designed to subvert that. And in fact, through the implementation of busing, Little Rock did make meaningful strides towards desegregating its schools. In the late 1970s, the Little Rock School District ratio between white and black students in Central High is nearly 50-50. And the Little Rock School District, ironically, becomes a sort of model school district in the nation for what might be possible through processes like busing. So the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, for example, highlights Little Rock as a model of school integration uh, because of its successful implementation of a busing program in the 1970s. And the commission is vigorously trying to defend busing during this period of time because it's gotten a bad name through the way that it's been portrayed in media accounts and through the kinds of clashes which were occurring in the 1970s, not only in the South, but also in the North in cities like Boston where white residents of the neighborhood of Southie vigorously protested the introduction of African-American students into their schools through busing in that city. Right, and that's where we also see the introduction of the important adjective forced busing, so that it takes on a more pernicious character. Um, There's a lot of symbolism, there's a lot of important language at, at play here. That's right, and in the South, in the 1950s, figures like Virgil Blossom had distanced themselves from the mobs outside of Central High School, right? had argued, you know, we're not like them. We're trying to comply with the Brown decision the best way that we can. And we see a similar kind of distancing happening in the 1970s, where anti-busing advocates argue that what is at stake in these court cases in the 1970s is fundamentally different from what was at stake in Little Rock in 1957. They distanced themselves from overt racism on display in 1957 
both temporally, right? Because I say time has passed, we've moved past that, but also geographically by suggesting that racism and discrimination and segregation is only a Southern problem. And in this distancing you're, you're talking about, this is sort of the where the triumphant narrative of racial progress really comes into play because people can point back to this very simplistic version of the civil rights movement and say, look, way back when, by now 40 years ago or 30 years ago, we largely resolved this, this question and uh, racism has been diminishing almost naturally ever since. So we don't really need these you know, heavy-handed desegregation efforts. We don't need them. And, and others would also say they simply don't work. And that furthermore, that this in some ways says, well, yes, there still is a problem of racial inequities, but that's not due to these institutions or these policies. So tell us a little bit more about that view that particularly picked up by some politicians and judges as a way to say we can now remove a school district from being under scrutiny by court supervision. Yeah, in fact, many people who opposed the extension of systemic desegregation remedies like busing or other things into the 1980s and 1990s not only argued that they were not necessary, but actually argued that they discriminated against whites. Yes. And this is, you know, based on the premise that systemic racism has been eliminated, right? And so racism comes to be understood or redefined, I think both in our popular discourse, but also in our federal courts of law as something that affects individuals rather than groups. And consequently, then the victim of racial discrimination can come to be seen to be both black or white, right? That whites too can be victim to discriminatory race-based policy. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, many anti-busing opponents and others who oppose systemic desegregation remedies actually claimed the legacy of the civil rights movement for themselves. Because what they began to argue in federal courts of law was that the real purpose of the Brown versus Board of Education decision was to eliminate any consideration of race in student assignment. Mm -hmm. And so even if you were considering a student's race and student assignment or in order to advance the principle of inclusion or diversity, they argued that that was unconstitutional under the original mandate outlined in Brown versus Board, right? So it's not just that racial discrimination is in the past, but also that continuing forward with these kinds of efforts to remedy racism's effects was potentially damaging to society and specifically to whites. Right, that it perpetuates racial racist thinking and that we can't we all agree that policy should be colorblind, which is a really powerful argument, but one that also ignores a lot of data, a lot in massive amounts of research that gets into the problems of institutional racism and structural inequality and, and all of those things. So that leads to, you know, it's starting in the, I don't know if you, where you would start, but the 80s and 90s with federal courts backing off and federal policy really backing off of desegregation efforts. Yeah. So in the courts in the 1990s, we really begin to see a sea change in school desegregation litigation. The face of the Supreme Court had really been changing since the late 1970s. Richard Nixon, who had been president during this controversy surrounding busing and had been very vocal in his opposition to busing appointed four Supreme Court justices during his time in office. And consequently, the court took on a more conservative cast. And that really came to full fruition in terms of school desegregation litigation in the 1990s, when the courts began to advance arguments that were really based on and rooted in this triumphal narrative of progress. So in several court decisions, they supported the claim that racial inequity in a school district in the 1990s was less likely to be a vestige of segregation or racial discrimination as more time passed, right? So it didn't necessarily matter what educational policies or programs the school district had put in place. The passage of time itself was sufficient to indicate that that was no longer racial discrimination tied to the kinds of segregation that had existed in the Jim Crow era. We also begin to see courts suggesting that school districts only need to do what is practicable in their language to eliminate racial discrimination. And that argument is based on the claim, essentially, that racial inequity among students in terms of achievement and student outcomes can be driven by a variety of factors outside of a school district's control. And in the 1990s, we should really see the rise of this kind of rhetoric, this argument that recurrent or persistent racial inequities in the United States 
are the product of problems within communities of color, right? The culture of poverty or the failure to transmit appropriate values that contribute to academic success. This kind of racist rhetoric is naturalized and justified in our federal courts and in our cultural discourse in the 1990s. And school districts across the nation petitioned for release from court oversight and court-mandated desegregation on these grounds, essentially arguing that they've done all that they can do to address these problems and that the remaining problems are not something that can be satisfactorily addressed through desegregation programs. And Little Rock is one of these districts that does that. What they're essentially arguing is, we've done all we can, it's now up to them and them being people of color, that they're going to have to get their act together. And if they don't, then it's their fault and no fault of politics or or policy. That's right. Yep. And then another thing that's happening is this, you know, the booming heritage industry and the emergence of something that would have shocked people decades ago, which is this civil rights tourism. Tell us a little bit more about what's happening in Little Rock to really amplify the triumphant narrative, because they're preserving sites and building museums and doing quite a bit to celebrate that 1957 moment? Sure. So Little Rock had attempted to market civil rights history, really stretching all the way back into the early 1960s. But there was no sort of civil rights site or heritage site where people could absorb the story of Little Rock and draw lessons from it and apply it to the present. And people were actually coming to the city of Little Rock and seeking out Central High because of its iconic status. And civic leaders in the city, including um, leaders in the Chamber of Commerce and elsewhere, recognized that there was a potential opportunity for Little Rock to tap into this stream of tourists who were already seeking some place to come to understand what the import of the crisis had been. And so in the years leading up to the 40th anniversary of the crisis in 1997, many of these civic leaders began to work with local civil rights organizers and community activists in an effort to try to create a museum that would be a place where people could come to understand more about the Little Rock school desegregation crisis. And they imagined opening it or dedicating it in relation to the 40th anniversary in 1997. And as those processes got underway, different constituencies within the community tried to advance different arguments in terms of how the crisis should be remembered and how the events of 1957 should be related to those of the late 20th century and ultimately today, right, the 21st century. Right, not just compartmentalized. Right. And as we know, within those kinds of arguments that people have about how to memorialize and where to memorialize, not all members of that process can advance their perspectives with as much force or with as much power as others. And so consequently, what was ultimately produced in 1997 in Little Rock was an interpretive exhibit that was sort of contained within the bays of a mobile service station, which was immediately across from Central High School in 1957 that attempted to sort of outline the sequence of events that made Little Rock famous in 1957. But little attempt was made in that interpretive space to connect that to the conditions that Little Rock schools were confronting or finding themselves living with in 1997, just across the street at Central High School. Right. It's really almost in some ways not just capturing 1957. It's really capturing the the first few days of the crisis. So this you know, in in the aftermath of that first big effort, there now is a much larger interpretive center that's been constructed as well. What's your assessment in terms of what voices are heard in that institution? So the visitor center that most people would encounter today has been built and created by the National Park Service. Central High School was declared a national historical site in the late 1990s. And the small kind of exhibit that had been created in the mobile gas station was not large enough to accommodate the kinds of visitors that were beginning to come to the National Historic Site. So they actually planned and constructed a new interpretive facility that was opened in 2007 on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the crisis. And that facility incorporates a lot more voices. The National Park Service has done an extensive oral history project, and many of the voices of Little Rock Nine and other actors who were immediately involved in the events of 1957 are captured in that exhibit, and visitors can explore the perspectives of um, the people who participated in events themselves through interactive kiosks and things like that. The exhibit very much continues to frame Little Rock as an example of American democracy in motion, right? So this was a constitutional crisis. 
where the implementation of the Brown versus Board of Education decision was challenged. This was a place where the federal government intervened to ensure that American civil rights would be recognized. But the exhibit goes one step further than past memorial efforts in that it does recognize that the change that occurred in Little Rock was precipitated by civil rights activism. Right. Not only by the Little Rock Nine or Daisy Bates, but also by tireless advocates for civil rights in Little Rock who had laid the groundwork for the legal action that resulted in the desegregation of Little Rock schools in 1957. So it does expand the coverage a little bit, but it expands it backwards or back in time, you know, to what leads up to 1957. But does it do much about taking the story forward as we've been talking about, or does it sort of leave it as this perfectly encapsulated moment in the civil rights timeline? In that primary interpretive space within the visitor center, it does sort of briefly touch on things that happened after 1957. But the exhibit suggests that Little Rock had successfully desegregated its schools in the 1970s and doesn't really address all the events that transpired after that in terms of the rollback of court oversight and the resegregation of American educational system. And this is important not only in relation to what has happened in Little Rock School District, but what really has happened in school districts across the country. Right. And I think that the Little Rock Central High School National Historic Site is uniquely positioned to address some of these issues precisely because it is our only historical site that is also a functioning school. Little Rock Central High School continues to service thousands of students directly across the street from the visitor center. And so the historic site is really in a unique position to draw those connections between past and present. Visitors do have the opportunity to engage with some of that if they're able to take a tour of Central High School today with a park ranger. Um, And of course, they can ask park rangers questions about conditions in the district and the like. But the primary sort of interpretive exhibit that you would see within the visitor center doesn't necessarily expand on those themes. Yeah, that's interesting. I do want to say, though, that National Historic Site has done a lot of work to engage with issues related to contemporary social justice. So they recently held, they called it a social consciousness gathering, where they brought together activists as well as civil rights pioneers, like some members of Little Rock Nine, to talk about how to advance social justice in the 21st century. So they have been engaged with that work. I think it would be nice for visitors to have a sense of how those strategies might be applied more immediately in the context of the school districts across the country. Right. As a, so where does this bring us to now? And that's actually where I'm heading now as we sort of wrap things up here. I always ask my interviewees to talk about, you know, why this, this story matters in the 1950s in the history of the United States. It has some very powerful, very images and colorful individuals. But, you know, history's only imp- really important if it has something to say to us today. And, I, and in some ways, you've already addressed that. But we obviously have a lot of misinformation and mythology at work in our contemporary American society, you know, Charlottesville being one vivid example. Is there a final word you have on sort of like why this story matters in 2017? Sure. You know, I am sitting just about an hour and 15 minutes away from Charlottesville. University of Mary Washington actually used to be the women's college for UVA. And so certainly our thoughts have been preoccupied with what happened in Charlottesville recently. And as I've been listening to a lot of the rhetoric and the aftermath of those events, I'm struck by a lot of parallels between the ways that people have been responding to Charlottesville and the ways in which people responded to Little Rock in the 1950s. We've heard a lot of uh, renunciations of, you know, the kind of overt racism and violence that we saw on the streets of Charlottesville in 2017, Mm -hmm. in just the same way that many people renounced and denounced the mobs outside of Central High School in 1957, 60 years ago. And certainly, we should all call on our public leaders to do that. I think we do need to be attentive to, though, the ways in which those kinds of ritual forms of denunciation of overt racism can prevent us from forthrightly dealing with the more insidious forms of systemic racism that continue to affect American life and society. So we've had a variety of public figures who have spoken out against what happened in Charlottesville. Attorney General Jeff Sessions, for example, came out and renounced the actions of the white supremacists in the city. But at the same time, he is overseeing a justice department that is slowly eroding the action of its civil rights division. That's right. That obviously has immediate import in relation to school desegregation across this country, for example. And so we need to be attentive not only to encouraging our political leaders to uh, renounce overt displays of racism, like those that 
were on show in 1957 in Little Rock or in 2017 in Charlottesville, but also to be attentive to the ways in which our public policies continue to advance and perpetuate systemic discrimination in the United States today, just as they did in the late 1950s. Well, that's that's well put. Well, Aaron Kretko Devlin, this has been great to talk to you about this book. A lot of really fascinating insight into you know this long running story of desegregation and efforts to desegregate not just schools but larger realms of, of American life, and also the role that knowledge of history and also historical memory and commemoration how all that can play a role in ultimately what kind of choices we make at the policy level. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about these issues. Erin Kretko Devlin is an assistant professor of history and American studies at the University of Mary Washington. She is the author of Remember Little Rock, published by University of Massachusetts Press and available everywhere. All right, everyone, time to close out this episode of In the Past Lane. As always, thanks for listening. To learn more about the stuff we discussed in this episode, just go to our show page at inthepastlane.com. There you'll find recommended readings, links, and more. And people, please, send us your comments, questions, and suggestions via Twitter, where I tweet as at inthepastlane, and Instagram, same thing, inthepastlane, and Facebook at inthepastlanepodcast. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, looks like you have a question. Let's hear it. It's 10 a.m. too early to start drinking. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. Thank <laughs> you.